President, I want to thank Senator Leahy uh, for his support of our amendment, for his beautiful words on John Lewis, and for his insistence that this Senate make sure that every American has the right to vote. That's not asking too much. And that's a bill that we should deal with. Mr. President, I rise to speak in support of the amendment I have filed to the National Defense Authorization Act to cut the bloated $740 billion Pentagon budget by 10% and use that $74 billion in savings to invest in humid needs here at home. This amendment is being co-sponsored by Senators Markey, Warren, Merkley, and Wyden, Senator Leahy, and will receive a roll call at 12.10 p.m. This amendment has been endorsed by more than 60 organizations representing millions of working people, environmentalists, and religious leaders, including Public Citizen, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Physicians for Social Responsibility. Mr. President, in America today, we are experiencing an extraordinary set of crises unprecedented in the history of the United States of America. We are in the midst of a public health crisis that is worse than any time since the Spanish flu of 1918. Over the past four years, four months, the coronavirus has infected more than 3.7 million Americans and caused nearly 140,000 deaths. We are in the midst of the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. During the COVID-19 pandemic, 119 million Americans have seen a decline in their income. Unbelievable. 119 million Americans have seen a decline in their income. 50 million have filed for unemployment and American households have lost over $6 trillion in wealth. All over this country, in the state of Vermont and in every other state in America, people are going hungry in America. People are going hungry. And many, many people are frightened to death that they will soon be evicted from their apartments or will lose their homes to foreclosure. That is where the American people are today. Loss of jobs, loss of income, hunger, eviction. But on the other hand, there's another reality going on in America today. We don't talk about it much, but we should. And that is that 600 billionaires in our country have seen their wealth go up by $700 billion during their pandemic. So we entered this pandemic with massive income and wealth inequality. Since the pandemic, the very rich have become even richer, while working people have seen a significant decline in their income and wealth. Mr. President, the current crisis, or series of crises, has revealed the extraordinary inequities in our economy. People didn't know it before, they surely know it now. In the United States, today, over half of our workers live paycheck to paycheck. And not surprisingly, when you live paycheck to paycheck and the paychecks stop coming in, you are in financial distress. And that means that your economic situation goes from poverty, which is low wages, to desperation, which is no income coming in at all. And that means that you go hungry. It means that you may become homeless. It means that when you get sick, 
you no longer have health insurance or the income to see a doctor. What the pandemic has taught us is that a relatively low unemployment rate, which is what we had before the pandemic, does not adequately guarantee for the security and well-being of working families. When tens of millions of our people earn starvation wages, that is not a good economy. When 40% of our people do not have the savings to pay for a $400 emergency, that is not what I would call a good economy. When over half a million Americans are homeless and 18 million families spend at least half of their incomes on housing, that is not a good economy. When 87 million people are uninsured or underinsured, that is not a good economy. In other words, to create a good economy, we're going to have to do a whole lot better than that. Further, Mr. President, over the last few months, hundreds of thousands of Americans have taken to the streets to demand justice for the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Rashad Brooks, and Ahmed Arbery, among many others, and to end the rampant police brutality that we see in America today. These tragic killings of unarmed African Americans have highlighted the urgent need to rethink the nature of policing and to fix a broken and racist criminal justice system. And, Mr. President, on top of all of that, on top of a pandemic, on top of an economic collapse, on top of systemic racism, we have got to address the existential threat facing this planet of climate change. A few weeks ago, temperatures in Siberia, the coldest region on Earth, topped 100 degrees, shattering records. And if we do not get our act together and transform our energy system away from fossil fuel and into renewable energy, we will be leaving this planet increasingly unhealthy and uninhabitable for our kids and future generations. So that is where we are today. Hunger, homelessness, racism, a warming and dangerously warming climate. And these are the issues that we have got to focus on. Our attention must be on improving the lives of ordinary Americans, working people, lower income people, and doing what we can to work with countries around the world to help the billions of people living in economic distress. And with that, Mr. President, I rise today to make it abundantly clear that if we're going to address those issues, if we're going to protect the working families of this country who are now under so much stress, it is absolutely imperative that we change our national priorities. The status quo and conventional wisdom that we see on TV every day and that we hear on the floor of the Senate, it's no longer good enough. History has overtaken us. Unprecedented crises have overtaken us. Status quo is not good enough. We must respond. We must finally have the courage to stand up to powerful special interests and all of their campaign money and understand that we cannot allow these people to continue to have so much power over the economic and political life of this country, that we must start developing policies that work for working families, not just the rich, not just the powerful, and not just those who contribute to super PACs. 
53 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. challenged our country to fight against three major evils, and I quote, the evil of racism, the evil of poverty, and the evil of war, end of quote. That was what Dr. King said 53 years ago. And if there was ever a moment in American history when we need to respond to Dr. King's clarion call for justice and demand, as he stated, quote, a radical revolution of values, end quote, now is that time. This is the moment for us to bring about what Dr. King called a radical revolution of values. Whether it is fighting against systemic racism and police brutality, whether it is transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel, whether it is ending a cruel and dysfunctional healthcare system, or addressing the grotesque level of income and wealth inequality in our country, now is the time for change, real change. <clears throat> in my view, given all of the unprecedented crises our country faces, now is not the time to increase the Pentagon's bloated $740 billion budget, which is 53% of all discretionary spending in, in America. Let me repeat that. The military budget alone is 53% of all discretionary spending in this country. At a time when 28 million Americans are in danger of being evicted from their homes, now is not the time to be spending more on the military than the next 11 nations combined. At a time when 30 million Americans have lost their jobs, now is not the time to be spending more on national defense than we did at the height, the height of the Cold War or the wars in Korea or Vietnam. Let me repeat, spending more in real inflation accounted for dollars today on the military than we did during the Cold War or the wars in Korea or Vietnam. At this unprecedented moment in our history, now is the time to provide jobs, education, health care, and housing in American communities that have been ravaged by the global pandemic, by extreme poverty, <clears throat> by deindustrialization, and mass incarceration. If this horrific pandemic we are now experiencing has taught us anything, is that national it is that national security means a lot more than building bombs, missiles, jet fighters, submarines, nuclear warheads, and other weapons of mass destruction. National security also means doing everything we can to improve the lives of our people, many of whom have been abandoned by our government decade after decade. The amendment that I'm offering today would cut the $740 billion budget, Pentagon budget, by 10 percent and use that $74 billion in savings to invest in distressed communities in every state in this country, communities that have been ravaged by poverty, mass incarceration, and other enormous problems. Under this amendment, distressed cities and towns would be able to use this $74 billion to create jobs by building affordable housing, new schools, 
child care facilities, community health centers, public hospitals, libraries, sustainable energy projects, and clean drinking water facilities. These communities would also receive federal funding to hire more public school teachers, provide nutritious meals to children, and offer free tuition at public colleges, universities, or trade schools. Mr. President, over and over again, our Republican friends, my colleagues here, have told us we cannot possibly afford to address the enormous problems facing working families. We just can't afford it. We don't have the money to deal with homelessness and hunger and inadequate education. That is what they say every day. We have been told that we cannot afford to make public colleges and universities tuition free or to provide a decent income for every man, woman, and child. But Mr. President, when it comes to spending $740 billion on the military, well, suddenly, hey, money is no problem. We can spend as much as we want. Hey, let's listen to all of the lobbyists from the military industrial complex who flood Capitol Hill, tell us all their needs. We got to listen to them, but we don't listen to the children in this country who may not have enough food to eat, or the workers in this country who are sleeping out in their cars. We don't listen to them. But when it comes to the military, hey, no end to the money that we can provide. Mr. President, to my mind, that is unacceptable. We don't need more nuclear weapons. We don't need more cruise missiles. We don't need more fighter jets. But what we do need in this country desperately is more health care, more housing, more child care, and better schools. Now is the time to fundamentally change our national priorities. And that is what this amendment is all about. This amendment in itself is not going to do any, anywhere near what we need to do as a country. But it is an important step forward in changing the way we think about our needs. Mr. President, let me be clear. If we were to institute a 10% cut in military spending, that $74 billion could provide high-quality child care to every family in America. Imagine that. We could solve the child care crisis in America just by cutting the military budget by 10%. We could, by cutting the military budget by 10 percent, provide Section 8 housing vouchers to all of the 7.7 .7 million families in America who are paying more than half of their limited incomes on rent. A 10 percent cut to the Pentagon could provide a free college education for 2 million low-income students. A 10 percent cut to the Pentagon is enough to hire 900,000 teachers in the poorest schools in America. So, Mr. President, I am a little bit tired about hearing that we don't have enough money for nuclear weapons that we need more money for missiles and tanks and guns. We need more for all of that, and yet we are turning our backs on Americans who are hurting the most. Mr. President, I believe that this is a moment in history when it would be a very good idea for all of my colleagues, Democrat and Republican, to remember what former Republican, Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower said in 1953. And I think we all recall 
that Eisenhower knew something about military budgets and the war, because he was the four-star general who led the Allied forces to victory in Europe during World War II. He was not a pacifist. He was not an anti-war activist. He was a four-star general. And what Dwight D. Eisenhower said, and I quote, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children, end of quote. And right now, when the world is searching for treatment to the coronavirus, when we're searching desperately and spending billions looking for a vaccine, maybe it might be a good idea to be educating our young people to figure out how we deal with disease, with cancer and schizophrenia and Alzheimer's and diabetes, rather than putting more and more scientists into figuring out how we can blow the world up a dozen times over. <coughs> What Eisenhower said was true, profoundly true, 67 years ago, and it is true today, maybe even truer today. Mr. President, when we analyze the Defense Department budget, it is interesting to note that the Congress has appropriated so much money for the Defense Department that the Pentagon literally does not know what to do with it. And between 2013 and 2018, they actually returned more than $80 billion in funding back into the Treasury. They had more money than they could spend. In my view, the time is long overdue for us to take a hard look not only at the size of the Pentagon budget, but at the enormous amount of waste, cost overruns, fraud, and at the financial mismanagement that has plagued the Department of Defense for decades. Mr. President, let us be clear. We don't talk about it, but let's be clear. About half of the Pentagon's budget goes directly into the hands of private contractors, not our troops. And over the past two decades, virtually every major defense contractor in the United States has paid billions combined, have paid billions of dollars in fines and settlements for misconduct and fraud, all while making huge profits on those government contracts. Virtually every major defense contractor has been found guilty of misconduct or fraud. Since 1995, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and United Technologies have paid over $3 billion in fines or related settlements for fraud or misconduct. Further, Mr. President, I find it interesting that the very same defense contractors that have been found guilty or reached settlements for fraud are also paying their CEOs excessive, excessive compensation packages. Last year, the CEOs of Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman both made over $20 million in total compensation, while around 90% of these companies' revenue came from defense contracts. So in other words, for all intent and purposes, these companies are basically government agencies. 90% of the revenue coming in come from the taxpayers of this country. Meanwhile, the CEOs of those companies make over 100 times more than the Secretary of Defense makes. It is not too surprising, therefore, that we have a revolving door where our military people end up on the boards of directors of these major defense companies. Moreover, Mr. President, as the GAO has told us, there are massive cost overruns in the Defense Department's acquisition budget that we continue to ignore year after year. According to the GAO, the Pentagon's $1.8 trillion acquisition portfolio currently suffers for more than $628 billion in cost overruns, with much of the cost growth taking place after production. Mr. 
Mr. President, a major reason why there is so much waste, fraud, and abuse at the Pentagon is the fact that the Defense Department remains the only federal agency in America that has not been able to pass an independent audit. Many of us will recall what then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, George W. Bush's Secretary of Defense, told the American people on the day before 9-11. Never got a lot of attention. Day before 9-11. And Rumsfeld said, quote, our financial systems are decades old. According to some estimates, we cannot track 2.3 trillion in transactions, end of quote. I don't know that the situation has changed very much since 2001 and Rumsfeld's remarks. And yet, nearly 20 years after Rumsfeld's statements, the Defense Department has still not passed a clean audit, despite the fact that the Pentagon controls assets in excess of $2.2 trillion, or roughly 70 percent of what the entire federal government owns. Mr. President, I believe in a strong military, but we cannot keep giving more money to the Pentagon than it needs when millions of children in this country face hunger every day and 140 million Americans cannot afford the basic necessities of life without going into debt. 1967, Dr. King warned us that, quote, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death, end quote. And I believe the time is long overdue for us to listen to Dr. King. At a time when in the richest country in the history of the world, so many of our people are struggling, now is the time to change our priorities because, as Dr. King stated, we are approaching spiritual death. Mr. President, at a time when we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on Earth, at a time when 60,000 Americans die each year because they can't get to a doctor on time, and one out of five Americans cannot afford the prescription drugs their doctors prescribe, we need to start focusing on those people, not on the military-industrial complex. Mr. President, at this moment of unprecedented national crises, a pandemic, an economic meltdown, the demand to end systemic racism, and an unstable president, it is time for us to truly focus on what we value as a society and to fundamentally transform our national priorities. Cutting the military budget by 10 percent and investing that money in human needs is a modest way to begin that process. So let me conclude, Mr. President, by once again quoting Dwight D. Eisenhower. I don't know that I've ever quoted a Republican quite as much as I have during these remarks, but he is somebody who I respected very much. And this is what Eisenhower said when he left office, and this was back in 1961. He was out, John F. Kennedy was coming in. And this is what he said, and I hope we all can remember this. He said, and I quote, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist." End of quote. Eisenhower was right then, and if anything, the situation is worse Today. Now is the time for us to stand up to the greed and irresponsibility of the military industrial complex. Now is the time to address the needs of working families, the elderly, the children, the sick, and the poor. Mr. President, let us vote for the Sanders, Markey, Warren, Merkley, Wyden, Leahy Amendment 
to cut the Pentagon budget by 10 percent and to invest in human needs here at home. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator from Massachusetts. Mr. President, thank you.